Hello, my name is Jeffrey Horn, and today I'm going to be talking about virtual reality as a new field and React VR. So virtual reality can be defined as the computer-generated computer simulation of a three-dimensional image or environment that can be interacted with in a seemingly real or physical way by a person using special electronic equipment, such as a helmet with a screen inside or gloves fitted with sensors. So a virtual reality experience constitutes of three-dimensional images and graphics that appear life-size, as well as accurate tracking for the user's movements, specifically head and eye movements. The experience should be immersive, taking the user and making them into a part of another reality. Interaction with the environment is also necessary to create a completely immersive experience. This combination of interactivity and immersion is known as telepresence. The most common and simplest example that we all use of telepresence is any form of video chat, such as FaceTime or Skype. In 1993, computer scientist Jonathan Stewart published a paper called Defining Virtual Reality, Dimensions Determining Telepresence, where he defines telepresence as the extent to which one feels present in the mediated environment rather than in the immediate physical environment. Also explained in his paper is the idea of vividness. Vividness is made of two key aspects that are integral in creating a full and immersive virtual reality experience. The breadth and depth of detail in and information. Stewart explicitly defined vividness as the rep representational ri richness of a mediated environment as defined by its for formal features. That is, the way in which an environment presents information to the senses. Pictured here is a popular modern VR game, Job Simulator. In it, the user is immersed into a futuristic world where robots have replaced all jobs. The player, playing a human character, is directed by the robots, and they give the player instructions to act out very silly versions of current jobs, such as car mechanic or convenience store clerk. The entire experience is truly immersive, where the player can interact with nearly any and everything in the environment. So going back to Stewart, in his paper, he was saying that virtual reality should be defined by the user experience and not by the hardware. This definition is becoming more true today, with the advent of more advanced hardware, more affordable smartphones, and web-based libraries and frameworks built specifically for 3D graphics and VR experiences. So before the 1950s, virtual reality was more of an idea from science fiction stories rather than an actual practice. It could be argued that the Viewmaster, a stereoscope that was introduced in 1939, was the first consumer virtual reality device. Morton Heilig, however, was the first person to specifically create a virtual reality device. In 1962, he released a prototype called the Sensorama. It was a mechanical device that would stimulate most senses, sight, sound, smell, and touch. In 1968, Ivan Sutherland and Bob Sproul created the first VR head-mounted display, named the Sword of Damocles. It was so heavy that it had to be suspended from the ceiling. The mechanical arm that the display was connected to tracked head movements. The virtual reality environment that was created were simple wireframe rooms. In the late 1970s, the Aspen Movie Map was created by a team at MIT. It allowed a user to travel through the city of Aspen, Colorado. It had three modes summer, winter, and polygons, similar to wireframes. In the 1990s, many full commercial virtual reality experiences started to come into existence. Virtuality, an arcade VR platform developed by the Virtuality Group, could be found in arcades in the early 90s. Around the same time, Sega created the Sega VR1, uh, another arcade-based VR experience. Today, there are many VR devices that offer full and complete immersive experiences. On the lower end of today's devices, the Google Cardboard, shown on the left, makes use of a smartphone, offering an excellent VR experience. On the higher end of con consumer-grade VR devices lays the HTC Vive, here on the right. It makes use of light and laser tracking to create an extremely accurate room-scale VR experience. With VR becoming so accessible today, many web apps and content creators are using this to their advantage to elevate their products to the next level. 
When it comes to designing and coding a web app with a 3D and VR experience, there are many libraries and frameworks that help facilitate its creation. The one I'm going to talk about today is a part of Facebook's front-end library, known as React. It is unsurprisingly called React VR. So React VR is still in its infancy. The current um, build we can all use today is version 0.1.2. Released in December of last year, React VR was made with the express purpose of simplifying the process of bringing a VR experience to your web app. It incorporates APIs, such as WebGL and WebVR, as well as other libraries, such as 3.js, similar to a regular web app. React VR uses a Flexbox-style layout to control the layout of your app, and makes use of a style option tag, which takes CSS-like options as objects to control style. Data flows from component to component as props and state, the same as a regular React app. And passing state as props to a child, child component or adding state to a component is as easy as it is in a React app. There are many built-in components that ship with React VR. The view component, for example, is the equivalent to div in HTML. As part of the built-in component, you can pass it options, such as style or layout, as well as click and event handlers. View components can have other views as children, and each view component can have none or many children of any type. For example, you can nest multiple text components as children. You can give the parent styling and layout options. The children components inherit these properties. However, as of this build, if you create a text component within text components, the children components will not inherit any of the properties passed to the parent component. Apparently, this will be addressed in a future build. The last component I will talk about is the mesh component. The mesh component is uh, made of triangle polygons, which creates a triangle mesh. As it says in the docs, it is a collection of vertices, edges, and faces that define the shape of a polyhedral object. The mesh component takes one option other than style, and that is the source option. This allows the developer to load, attach, and style a 3D object. This object is passed to the mesh component using the built-in asset function, which accesses the static assets in your, in your directory, finds the proper object file, along with any other files that the object uses. There are many other built-in components one can use. Um, and because I don't have any code snippets in my presentation, I decided to just do some live code and quickly show you a VR app. So right now I have it running uh, on the server. Uh, this is if you install the React VR CLI tool, you can just type in react-vr init and then the name of your project, and it will create this. Uh, it creates a 3D room using a panoramic image that is supplied and writes hello with a blue background. So I already imported, uh, if you saw my hackathon yesterday, I had, uh, had a crate object. So I already imported that into my static assets. And I want to render a crate and make it move. And I'm going to show you how easy that is. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to import mesh from the React VR library. This will allow me to use the mesh component, just like any other React component that I import. Um, and then I'm going to give it style, just so we can see it. And it'll be in the right place when it renders for the first time. Sorry. So I can use the transform tag, which takes an array of options, which then, oops, as objects, and translate is it takes coordinates, uh, x, y, and z. So I'm going to give it 0, 1, and, oops, 0, 1, and, oh, God. Let's say negative 10. So you start with, when you, when you first render in, I'll show you. So we are looking at the negative z axis currently. y is up, and x, uh, I'm pretty sure, is to the right, positive. So then I'm going to give the mesh a source, which also takes an object within an object. And you pass it the asset function, which is a built-in function that goes to the proper asset um, folder over here, and give it the object, and then give it some texture as well. So you can pass it a uh, material. So instead of texture, if you have an MTL file, so like a material file, you can have it, instead of being texture, you can have it be material, if I could type. But 
since I have a JPEG, it's just a texture file. Okay, so let's see uh, if that works. Nope. Good. Ah, thank you. <laughs> So there is a crate. So now let's give it uh, some motion. So to do, to do that, I'm going to give it some state. So just like any React app, give it a constructor. I'm not going to be passing any props, so I'm going to ignore that for now. So this.state, if I can type, just can give it something simple. Uh, so give it a move speed equals 0. And then I'm going to want to create a function called this.move. And I also want a variable to hold time when I first create the app, because I'm going to use, when I first mount the component, because I'm going to use time as the kind of speed denominator. So for the function itself, I'm going to give it an, um, Another variable that holds a new time, so that'll be the, the amount of change in between uh, the, when the app first loaded in and now. And then this uh, variable change will hold the difference between now and when the app first started. I'm going to change the state because I'm going to be using move speed as the actual z coordinate. So then move speed then becomes this dot state move speed plus change. And uh, because change is going to be in thousands of milliseconds and I don't want the object to move super fast, I'm going to divide it by 2,000. So that's going to divide it just so it moves uh, half a z coordinate every frame. And then I'm going to create another variable on the actual component and then call request animation frame which will call this.move uh, every frame that uh, is rendering. So most browsers are 60 frames per second. So every 60, every second, it'll re-render uh, 60 times. So then when the component mounts, I want to call move in the first place. And then, pretty sure, let's move the coordinate back, and then give it another translate, which moves the z-coordinate. And we'll call that movement. And inside the render function, we'll say let movement equal this dot state dot move speed. And hopefully this works. Good, of course. Line 16. Ah. Can't believe I didn't catch that. Thank you very much.